Hello. Hey. Welcome back to number five of basic skills in artistic activism. And uh, I'm Steve. And I'm Steve Lambert. And this one is on cognitive science or cognitive science for artistic activists. Um, and the reason that we started doing this is somebody at a workshop one time was like, you guys must be reading all these books about uh, the most current brain research and stuff like that. And uh, we were like, no, that's not what we're doing at all. Um, but it actually intrigued us. Um, and it also puzzled us because like Steve, like we're supposed to be doing stuff about art, right? And art is all about like feelings and stuff like that, right? You're an artist, you know this sort of stuff. So why would we ever want to do anything about the brain? Um, because art is a media of communication, right? The idea is that you're, it might be poetic communication, but you're still trying to get an idea across. And in order to do that, you need to understand how people, how you encode information, how people receive information. And that has to do with how people think. and. There's a lot of research lately, which we now have read, um, that is helpful in, in how you communicate ideas and get through to people uh, who maybe don't agree with you, which is where it's important today, yeah. right? Yeah, and you know, I'm, I'm thinking back to one of my favorite uh, authors, uh, Walter Lippmann, the guy who came up with the idea of the manufacture of consent. Um, and he once said, we need to think rationally about the irrational. Um, that, it, that is, even if we understand that art sort of works on this affective register and is really about touching our emotions um, and is in this sort of the, the, the feeling, irrational uh, uh, you know, register, we can actually step back a second and say, okay, well, how do we understand that? And by understanding it, how can we actually use it more effectively? And that's really what we're all about here at the Center for Artistic Activism is we're really interested in what does it take to win. And in this case, what winning is, is um, changing people's minds, uh, opening up their perspectives, getting them to look at reality in a different way. Um, and as Steve said, one of the ways to do that is really by understanding how people make sense of information. I always like to think that we think a lot about thinking, but most of what we think about how we think is not how we think at all. Uh, and it was kind of a tongue twister. But when we did all this reading on cognitive science, we realized, okay, well, well, wow, this actually isn't the sort of common folk wisdom of how we make sense of information, at least not to most activists and not to most artists as well. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to do a little introduction to cognitive science. Uh, this is Steve, by the way. Uh, but it's going to take about 40 minutes, 35 minutes. We're going to go through kind of a you know brief lesson. Uh, think about it as like a year's worth of uh, readings on cognitive science and lectures on cognitive science in about 35 minutes. Then we're going to take people's questions, um, and then we're all going to go drink eggnog. Yeah. Oh yeah, because yeah, this is our special. Uh, I almost forgot holiday. Yeah. Woo! All right. Um, the holidays. The other thing I was going to say, sort of repeat something we talked about on the first webinar, is that that this is going to be inherently a little bit frustrating because as we see Trump put together his cabinet and all the ridiculous stuff that he's saying um, and and sort of calling forth, that we don't have like a real specific, like, oh, if you do this, it'll end, it'll stop, and you can get what you want. Um, it actually takes a lot of work. and. Uh, so what we're, the purpose of these webinars really is to prepare you for that work and to uh, and all the work that's going to come. So, um, so we'll who's, this dude, who's this dude we're looking at, Steve? Well, this is one way that, that my life could go. This is where I could be in decades. Yeah. Uh, the idea is that, you know, I've got the answers. And if you just let me explain the facts, uh, that, that it would all make sense, you know. Um, I could, I could, this could be the answer to some of your problems. <laughs> so, um, 
So this is, you know, a, a sort of noble impulse, um, the idea of, I, I just, if you just listen, I can help you. Um, and it sometimes leads to this. It more often leads to this. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is me. This is probably not where I'm headed, but certainly where I was for many, many years. Um, behind a, a paper, uh, a, a table filled with all these papers. Um, pamphlets usually in like eight point type so we could get more facts on the sheet and handing it out to people again with this assumption that if people just read the information I could put in their hands all of a sudden the scales would fall from their eyes and they would see reality as it really is which of course was seeing reality as I saw it yeah yeah the idea is like whatever book you believe in whether that's the Bible or the Communist Manifesto or the newest Naomi Klein thing or whatever it's like if you just read this, then you'd know. Um, because yeah, we really we ru ruined basically people's uh, holiday gifts. Because like everybody just bought the newest Naomi Klein, uh, now they're giving it to the, like the, their curmudgeonly uncle. He's like, ah, once he reads this, he's going to come to my side. Stop, you know, watching, you know, uh, Fox News. Uh, I hate to tell you, but this idea that the truth will set us free is absolutely not true. Yeah. Um, the truth won't oh, say it's so, it's so easy. Yeah. It's an enduring myth. Um, I mean, the idea of the truth shall set us free is actually from the Bible. Um, but it's also just part of our enlightenment heritage, um, which is we really kind of believe deep down inside of us that the truth has some revelatory function and that just putting the truth out there will actually get people to change their minds. And, and again, this might make some of you bristle, right? It's like, no, but the truth is important. We're not saying the truth isn't important. It is important. Um, but there's this really strong idea that Steve mentioned. Um, this is an image from the Enlightenment. It's how democracy is sort of theorized, right? Like smart people get together, they learn the facts, and then they make choices. And they're, that's why the press is so important, right? It's like we need to have the truth. And then rational people get together and um, decide the best way to move forward. In this uh, case, rational white men, of course. Um, and yeah. note the papers on the table in the foreground and the tables in the rear devoted to conversations on different subjects. Um, and again, this is, this is the baseline of democratic theory. Um, it's also the baseline of a rational capitalist market with full access to information and making reasonable decisions democracy will function and a capitalist society will function. That is great in theory, but in practice, democracy looks very different. Yeah, this is what democracy looks like. It's, uh, it's <laughs> Maybe we can make a chance, Steve. Wait, this is what democracy looks like. <laughs> um, in, in practice, it's a show, right? This is the Republican National Convention. And the Democratic National Convention is not that much different. It's it's about staging and lights and, and uh, and spectacle and we can lament this and say this is how everything has gone wrong um, but I, I would say it's always been the case that, that the way that people make decisions has as much to do with culture uh, or maybe more to do with culture as it does with the actual facts and how they think right which is why we're getting into this so and, and uh, we, you know we used to believe we used to believe this um, but we kind of thought of it more as a cultural phenomenon um, and what we realized actually, it has a lot to do with how our mind actually functions. Um, that is, it's not that we're drawn to spectacle, we're drawn to story, we're drawn to symbol and sign just because we live in the age of the spectacle. You know, uh, you know, Guy Debord was right, right? We live in a society of the spectacle. But it's not just that, it's actually, it's how our very minds and brains function. So, um... Again, I just want to put here in, in big, bold letters that the truth actually does matter. Um, we're not yeah. saying the truth doesn't matter. We need the truth, but the truth needs us. The truth needs help. Yeah, I mean, we're not some postmodern provocateur saying, ah, we can all create truth. Truth is just a narrative and so on and so forth. But the fact is, truth actually needs narratives. Um, if it's not based in truth, if our politics aren't based on truth, they won't have an ethical substance and they also won't last. Um, that is, is, the truth does have a way of wheeling out over a long haul, um, but the truth itself will not speak. We need to speak for it and help it speak. Yeah. So um, 
Let's keep going here. So this is how we get to cognition and how people think. And what we're going to do is do a little fun exercise in cognition to give you an idea of how this works. And um, what you're going to do, you can do the, kind of talk to us in the chat here also. Um, but we're going to show you some letters. And they're going to be a bunch of letters in order. Here, hold on, let me uh, get this going. There we go. Um, and what we want you to do is we'll flash them on the screen really quick. Try to memorize all the letters in order. And so are you ready? Are you ready, Steve? I'm ready. OK, here we go. Well, I am in a bit All right. So is there anybody that was able to memorize all the letters? Let's see. Not seeing. No, no one's put anything up there, so I, I, I don't know. We once did this in Scotland, and one person had a photographic memory and came up with about 12 of them. But yeah. we've done this with about 1,000 people in about 15 different countries. And usually you can remember the first three or four. And we were just in um, Ireland last week. And actually what someone did, which was really interesting, is they started to put it into words. And they, just like you just did. They were nonsense words, but they were words. Yeah. So let's 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 make it a little easier for people too. Sure. So we're going to show some words on the screen, and what we want you to do is try to memorize all the words in the order that you see them. And here we go. Ready? All right. All right. The you change. Yeah, that was pretty fast. I know. Oh man, give me a second more. So. Yeah? You want more? Yeah, give me a second more. Uh, okay. I think I got a couple more. So anybody able to memorize all of them and repeat them back in the order that they saw them? Okay, okay. Catherine, pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good. Um, so some of you, and it's a little bit easier when their letters are arranged into words, right? Um, because you can put it together into words. It's not just a bunch of letters. Um, we'll do it one more time. We're going to arrange the words into a sentence and see if you can remember the sentence. Now that's a lot easier, right? Yeah, and my guess is a fair amount of you out there actually were able to reassemble the words in that cloud into that sentence. And why we're able to do that and then why we're able to memorize that sentence is because it actually makes sense as a sentence and it draws upon a sentence that we've probably seen or heard before. Um, there's a famous quote from Gandhi. Um, and essentially what, we do, what we're doing is taking bits of information and assembling them into a basic story, a narrative, and a familiar narrative, which then allows us to remember, recall, and make sense of those words. Now, yeah. Steve, did Gandhi actually say that? Well, I was suspicious because it, it's such a great sentence and it fits so well on a bumper sticker that I started to wonder if it was actually what he said. And so Steve and I researched it and we found out this is what he actually said. If we could change ourselves, then uh, the tendencies in the world would also change. As a man changes his own nature, so does the attitude of the world change towards him. We need not wait to see what others do. It's not quite as catchy. It's nice. It's nice, but yeah, it's not as catchy. It doesn't fit as well on a bumper sticker. It's very uh, hard to memorize. Yeah. And so why are we telling you all this? Yeah, it's not because we want to simplify all of our information down to bumper sticker slogans. Um, that's not the function here. But because this little exercise will give us insight into how we actually make sense of information. And by we, we literally mean all human beings. Um, probably throughout most of time. And this exercise is meant to give you an idea of how our minds and our brains actually work, how we do and don't make sense of information. So, so this is how the brain works, but um, what we're going to do is sort of draw something out here uh, on our holiday thing. Let me. Uh, yeah, so when we think about how we make sense of information, we often think that there's sort of like objects of information which are out there, whether they're words or whether they're things we see on the street or facts we read and so on and so forth. And 
what we do is we put them in this big vast warehouse which is our mind um, and they're all jumbled up there and then when we need those facts those bits of information we actually just selectively pull them out one by one yeah now, I'm writing up like placeholders here as letters of different things that you might store in your mind in your memory or something right and like Steve was saying, we think of it as this warehouse. So if I want to remember something, I go into the warehouse and I pull the box that has F on it, and then inside that is the thought, and then I, I'm able to access it, right? So we just are able to keep all these things there. And this actually is not how it works, right? No, instead what we do is we actually make associations between bits of information, which Steve is going to draw with these little lines. That is, is that in order to access F, what we do is we connect it to C and E. Um, just as it, we don't really think about letters discreetly from one another, we always think about them in association with other letters which create formal constructs like words. Um, and so, okay. yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to talk about uh, that actor that you like so much. Yeah, so when you're trying to remember something you probably do something like this like I'm like alright there's that actor from that movie he was on moonlighting and um, he's in action movies and like I'm kind of making these connections between these disparate thoughts but I still can't remember his name um, he was married to that one lady and now he's married to the other lady and oh it's Bruce Willis right <laughs> <laughs> so you have these different thoughts and you are able to make sense of it by how they relate to each other I don't just have a thought about Bruce Willis. Right. right? Now, now, Bruce Willis has connections with other things. And uh, <laughs> as Steve's example somewhat illustrates, um, uh, these actually aren't random associations, but they're associations which are strung together in logical constructs. Um, and so if you go back, Steve, um, and sort of draw out how mm -hmm. we might think of A, B, C, D, E, and F. Um, We'd probably think about them if we if I said, well, A, B, C, D, E, and F. In your mind's eye, what you would do is you put them. Uh, what the heck is that, Steve? My handwriting isn't great. <laughs> uh, is you put them in the order of the alphabet, because that's actually how we've learned these letters. And then we have ways of recalling these letters. Um, you can put them as, in other order too. You can spell well, out things. You can put them in other order too. Yeah. Um, but they have to <laughs> have some sort of logic before them. And, and what these are is essentially mini stories. Um, we don't think of stories in terms of just words or an alphabet, but essentially that's what we're doing is we're creating sort of a logical structure of information. Um, and as Steve, you notice how Steve stopped at H, and it's probably because he can't remember what comes after H. Um, at least I can't remember what comes after H. And so what I do, and I used to work in a library, a long time ago, is I would sing the alphabet song to myself in order to figure out how to file books. Um, and so, do we have a slide? There we go. Uh, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. And why we teach kids to sing an alphabet song is it's actually a very efficient way to remember and retrieve what is essentially arbitrary information. Um, by, yeah, putting so alphabet, song, by putting it yes. into a story, we're able to access this information. And this order of the alphabet is actually arbitrary. It could be anything. And if we rearranged it where it was like, you know, P, M, L, K, C, F, right? Like, that's hard to remember because we don't have an alphabet song that goes in that order. The reason we're able to remember it in alphabetical order is because of the song. Yeah. And those of you that, are, that you know, are at home with the with the um, Roman alphabet, you've probably noticed when you travel to foreign countries which don't have a Latin-esque language, that it's actually very hard to remember street names. Um, for example, in Russia or in the Basque. We were in Ireland last week. Or, or in Ireland. Because the, the constructs just don't make sense, so I just can't remember the name. Um, even though it's only composed of five or six letters, it doesn't stick in a way that it would on a street in Spain or in France or Germany or what have you, where I'd have some sort of familiar construct. Um, in any case, now, the, here's where it gets really trippy, okay? Because this is not just about how the mind works, but actually how the brain works, that, that spongy tissue up here, is that as we grow, 
we make these constructs, these, these associations between bits of information, and they actually become softwared into our brain. They become patterns um, of least resistance within our brains. And so when I think of A and B, immediately, without much thought, my mind goes to C. And that's because over time, my brain has built up these neural pathways that actually connect this information. Um, cognitive scientists have this little jingle, which is, what is it? Neurons that fire together, wire together? Yeah, yeah. So um, I don't have to think about the order of the alphabet that often. I don't have to, um, like, <laughs> if I was watching a lot of Bruce Willis movies, I wouldn't have to think about his, it too much to remember his name. Um, when I'm, Another good example is, like, when you're driving, when you first learn to drive a stick or something, it's like you have to think about the actual process of pushing in the clutch and which is first and second and things like that. After a while, it starts to become soft-wired where you're not thinking about that as much. And this has served us really well over the years. Um, you can also think about this example, which is uh, when you touch a hot pan, which is, is actually you know, arguably hardwired in there. Like That's our, our response to touching something hot as you pull your hand away. If you had to think about it the whole time of like, oh, when did I put this pan on the, on the flame? And how long has it been? And, could it be hot enough to burn me? And I wonder what that smell is because my hand's now burning, right? So you don't want to have to think, or how to, and let me release every single finger and pull my hand back towards me. You don't have to think about that. And you don't have to think about every movement that you make when you're driving, which allows you to actually listen to the radio and sometimes even talk on the phone while you're driving, right? Because these patterns, again, are kind of mapped in your heads. So why are we saying this? How can we use this? As, yeah, what does this have to do with artistic activism? Let's talk we about this. Far afield. Um, so I think the first thing that uh, is important to know about this is that to know what we're up against, right? That this is actually a really difficult thing. It basically means that um, the people that we're talking to aren't really thinking about their political opinions. They're making, and some of you may have noticed this already, they're making these kind of snap judgments. Yeah, um, and this is this again runs counter. This, this runs counter to how we often think, because we think we're thinking about things, but the fact is most of the time we're not thinking at all. We're just reacting. And that goes as true for picking up a hot pan as it is for deciding what our political opinions are about something. Um, for example, if we can look at the very same bits of information, let's take the Obamacare health plan. And if we have a pre preconceived notion that Obama is someone who's trying to do a good job, we can overlook all the faults of the Obamacare legislation and still say, well, Obama is actually doing a good job. And yes, I know private insurance companies are running this, but still, it's just a step in the right direction sooner or later. And if we actually think of Obama as the Antichrist, we'd look at the same thing and see that those, look at those private companies running Obamacare and say, ah, but that's actually just a step towards global domination by the Muslim socialist conspiracy that's going to take away our guns. Um, and it's the same bits of information, but because of the associations we put together, we come to conclusions, not by reasoning, but by gut instinct. Yeah, so you, this happens with Trump too. Like if you have a family member that's a Trump supporter, they will look at the same information that you see and read it differently. Um, another thing I've been doing is look at how the New York Times covers a story and then go to Fox News and look at how they cover the same thing. They see it, they, you know, or it's something about Trump, right? They see Trump from a particular perspective. There's already these associations made. And so they read what he's doing. Uh, this thing with Russia is a great example, right? It's like how people make sense of that. If they already like Trump, they figure out a way to make sense of it. Um, so, okay. Uh, so, you, one of the ways to happens to think, in all people. I think that's that's another key thing is that it's not just like foolishness. Um, I mean, you could argue that between Fox News and the New York Times, one is 
has a little bit more journalistic integrity and is actually more true. But um, the point is that we all make these associations that we're not sort of figuring out our, our politics based on the facts or filling, figuring it out based on associations. Right. When it gets worse insofar as when you're presented with information that runs counter to your ideas, um, preconceived ideas, that in fact cognitive scientists have argued that we don't change our mind, we actually double down on the original idea. That as we find a way to either turn the facts to our advantage or we discount the facts entirely as just liberal or conservative lies. And so this is very problematic. Yeah, and as you uh, visit your family, you can watch it happen. So uh, that's one thing to know that we are up against. And this next thing is like a little exercise. What I want you to do, I think there's a way that you can raise your hand in the uh, webinar software so I can look at you all and see. And um, what I want you to do, I'm going to show you a picture. And if you um, think that this is wrong, what I'm going to show you, the picture shows something that is morally wrong, um, then raise your hand. As soon as you know, as soon as you feel it, right? As soon as you have a response. So here we go. Everybody ready? Are you ready, Steve? I'm ready. Okay. This is the picture. This is a Canadian uh, clubbing a baby seal. All right, so Clay, you know it's wrong. <laughs> Elizabeth, Denise, Frank, Gonzalo, Jana, Jenner. Okay, so a lot of you know it's wrong. So those of you that know it's wrong, tell me why it is wrong. And you can just type it into the chat. Why is this wrong? And we'll see what we get. So I'm seeing... Uh, we did this in Ireland like a week ago, and people said, um, infliction of needless suffering. Um, the animal doesn't have a fighting chance. It's horrific. He is using undue force. Okay, so needless suffering. I would say to that, um, he's clubbing the seal in the head. It's, gonna, it's not actually going to feel it. It's going to be dead before on impact. So it's not really needless suffering. I don't know, Steve. You're, you're pretty heartless. I'm just saying it's not going to suffer. Um, undue force. I would say less force would, would uh, hurt the seal more. Um, Marlene, you're saying, what about native peoples whose life revolves around these... Ah, uh, Marlene, good, good point. I mean, well, for all you know, I would, why is it inhumane? Um, now, I'm well, checking... let's go, we'll go back to what Marlene said, which is, which is interesting, which is we actually don't know this isn't an Inuit who actually depends upon seals and has been doing this for thousands of years. Um, and so therefore, I mean, what I think about Marlene is that she had a very different reaction. And then the question is, well, where did that reaction come from? It might have come from Marlene's actually culture. Um, and it may be in the Marlene, because everybody else is posting things up there, step back for a second and thought about it. So I see also here uh, magnitude, Frank says, is the, is the thing that's wrong. They don't just kill to eat. They kill thousands, and it's wasteful. But I would say we don't actually know that's what's happening in this picture. In this picture, we actually don't even know that the seal got hit. But we just said, oh, it's wrong, right? Assumption of species hierarchy, the right to the life of another species. Um, the seal also could already be dead. We don't know, right? Now. Okay, so why are we talking about this? Yeah, Steve, are you like justifying like seal slaughter? I mean, is this the secret? No. The secret oh, no. is? Yeah, I'm not going to get into that because that's not the point. <laughs> the point is that we have a stimulus, which is the image, and then you think, you know, I'm a smart person. I look at it. I think about whether it's right or wrong, and then I form an opinion. That's what a reasonable person does. That's what I did. That's what... Uh, Frank, you did, Elizabeth, Catherine, all of you were like, yeah, you know, I look at it, I think about it, I form my opinion. In fact, um, the opposite is what happens. You have the stimulus, you form an opinion, right? I told you, decide whether or not you think it's right or wrong right away, which you did, which is what we all do most of the time. And then when I said why, you um, start thinking of reasons why. So that's the order it happens in. I show you something, 
you have a gut feeling about whether or not it's right or wrong and then figure out why you feel that way. And this is how we make most of our sort of moral decisions, um, most of our decisions about politics, right? And um, basically our mind's already made up. So these things this that we're is, this is are really depressing. Uh, and, and why it's so depressing is because we are in the business of changing the way people think. But if actually people are making decisions in a split second, if people tend to agree with those things they already agree with and disagree with those things they already disagree with, and if people are coming up with their opinions based on the stimulus and not going through reason, then we're actually, it's, it's pretty tough to change people's minds. Not only that, it's tough because it's actually wired into their brains, or rather our brains. And so like, well, what are we supposed to do? I mean, all of this is essentially an argument for we're totally fucked. Yeah, and that facts, like, you know, we can present facts, but people already have their minds made up. Luckily, we're not going to leave you there. Yeah. <laughs> that there are actually things we can do. Um, and so one of the things we can do is learn how to tell really good stories. Um, if people are making sense of information within stories they tell themselves, then one of our jobs is actually to tell stories around our information so people can make sense of them. That is, if we just feed people facts, there's no place for those facts to go. They literally bounce off. Um, but if we can embed our facts within stories, that make sense to people, then they'll actually listen to our facts because they can make sense of them. And stories aren't just, you know, uh, this thing that politicians do where they ask about the issue, how do you feel about the seal clubbing thing? And they say, I met a woman named Mary the other day, and she's been clubbing seals <laughs> for decades, and she told me this. That's not a good story, right? You're, you're, totally, like, totally, you're totally worrying me with your levity about seal clubbing. I'm just going to keep you worrying. Yeah, I, I, I see that. I got a vacation. We're going to drive up north and bring a baseball bat. It is not funny. It is not funny. It would be not funny if I was uh, serious. All right, anyway, back to stories. <laughs> see, I have an opinion, and I'm rationalizing it right now. Um, and so is Steve. Yeah, so we do this all the time. Okay, anyway, um, with uh, stories, um, you, there's a lot of elements that make up a good story. So you need a hero, you need villains, you need an arc that happens at the beginning and middle and the end, um, some sort of crisis and resolution. Um, these are the things that make a good story. And this is why artists are often better at this, because they understand this kind of thing. We also um, need to listen to the stories that people already tell themselves and figure out how to fit our facts, our opinions into those stories. Um, it follows from what we've been saying that people have ways of making sense of information that they already employ. And one of the things we can do is go out and listen to the stories that people tell themselves. Um, listen to the stories they tell themselves about how they perceive identity, perceive community, perceive what is a good life, and so on. And instead of hitting them with our own stories, which may actually rub against those stories, we can actually listen to how they make sense of information and try to fit what we're interested in into those pre-existing stories. And we have a great example of this, which is don't mess with Texas. So. We've done a lot of workshops down in Texas, and one of the most amazing things about Texas, um, and any of you who are uh, watching this right now from Texas know this already, obviously, is that Texas is exceptional. Um, you will take the most far left, you know, uh, pacifist, tree hugging lefty from Texas, and talk to them about Texas for a while, and they will just talk about how much they love Texas. And actually, I'm going to Texas next week, and when I tell people around here that I'm going to Texas, and around here is being New York City, they're like, why would you want to go to Texas? 
And I say because Texas is an awesome state. It's an exceptional state. Um, and it has all sorts of exceptional problems. One of the problems that Texas faced was littering, um, particularly littering on the highway, because part of being exceptional is you can drive any place with your pickup truck and throw a beer can out the window, and it doesn't really matter. And in the mid-1970s, 1980s, the Texas State Highway Department was faced with this real big problem. And the real pro big problem was there was just garbage on the highways. And so they started an environmental campaign. Now, the problem with talking about environmentalism in Texas, as Steve likes to say, it's like announcing you're a vegan at a barbecue, okay? It just does not go over well, right? Um, is, you know, environmentalism in the Texan mind is something which is associated with effete intellectuals on both coasts or government bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. And so the traditional ideas of like how to launch an environmental campaign about caring for the environment, getting ideas of looking forward into the future, were just not going to work in Texas. So they did something else. That's your cue, Steve. Um, they made this don't mess with Texas sign, which I always thought was just worn by, you know, bullies <laughs> about themselves, you know, because they were from Texas. But in fact, it was this littering campaign. And if you mess with Texas, you're, you're, uh, if you litter, you're messing with Texas. And it had this incredible result, which was decreasing substantially littering in the state of Texas. Yeah. And what it did is it played off the stories the Texans already told themselves, which is, we're exceptional, we're macho, and instead of making environmentalism this sort of, you know, thing from the coast or bureaucratic, it became a macho affront to Texans. So this is one way you can listen to, like, what, what people are saying is important to them, the needs that they are trying to find met through things or the narratives that they tell themselves about their lives and their states and use them in other ways. Um, we have some other, oh, and then this can be reused also. Um, this is an example of that don't mess with Texas sort of narrative being repurposed for uh, abortion rights. So, um, and also it's been reappropriated by others, including macho guys who like to push people out of their way, right? That's right, that's the problem is that all stories, all symbols can be appropriated by many, many different causes. All right, but we're telling them good news. We're not, uh, we're not talking about... Yeah, that is good news. We can appropriate their yeah. stories, but it doesn't mean the stories we tell will not be appropriated as well. Yeah, it's a dance, and the other side knows how to dance too. So the other good news is that we often have complex political ideas. There's very, it's very rare that you find somebody whose politics aligned perfectly with the GOP or the Democrats or whatever parties exist uh, in the country that you live in, but they don't line up perfectly. People often have complex ideas or different ideas when it comes to, um, you know, federal level politics or local politics. And so we can use this. We can, um, we can figure out how they align in certain aspects and then uh, and then connect with those. So one example is uh, a friend of ours, Linda Sarsour, who is a Muslim American activist from Brooklyn, born in Brooklyn with a thick Brooklyn accent, um, also wears the hijab. And around the time of Hurricane Sandy, the, in the weeks after, there was a, uh, they went and were helping people in Staten Island. And they were in a particular, particularly in a neighborhood that had not had electricity in several days. So nobody really had even hot food. So they showed up with hot pizza and buckets and they offered to bail people's uh, basements out and give them some pizza. And so Linda shows up in her hijab, her hijab and uh, knocks on the door and this old woman, you know, kind of opens up the door just to crack and says, what do you want? And she says, oh, we're helping people bail out their basements, and we've got hot pizza. And the woman was like, hmm, closes the thing, unlatches it, unlatches it, and lets Linda in. And they start bailing out her basement and help her out, give her some pizza, and after a while, they're sitting around and talking, and the woman says, um, you know, I have to be honest with you. I, I helped fight against 
the mosque uh, that they were going to build in Staten Island. And I, I wanted to say I'm sorry because I thought I didn't realize that they could be like you. And she had imagined that all Muslims were these dangerous outsider terrorists. But she also had another idea, another sort of story in her head um, about what it meant to be a good neighbor. And Linda lined up with the good neighbor idea, that part of her mind. And that was the way that this woman's, what's the word? No, <laughs> Bruce Willis. Bruce. <laughs> Her prejudice was it, sort of undermined. It, yeah, it fit into the narrative that this woman had about what is a good neighbor. And Linda did this very consciously. Um, Linda's a very smart organizer. And she understood if she knocked on people's doors and said, Hi, my name's Linda. I'm the head of this political organization. I want to talk to you about a mosque. All of a sudden, this woman would have seen her as this political person who was trying to change her mind about this idea of a mosque. And so what Linda did is she just an, an, did an end run around this whole thing and fit into another narrative. Now, there's a problem with all of these strategies. The problem with all of these strategies, the idea of telling stories or fitting into other people's stories or trying to figure out where in the complexity of our political minds that I can slot my ideas in, is that in the end, it means we're working with what people already have. And if we really want to change the world, we sometimes have to write a new script. Now, Don't Mess With Texas was awesome, right? But it also helped fuel a sort of belligerence about, you know, <laughs> of Texans, which continues on to this day. You know, this has been an argument about marriage equality. Yeah, it's great to talk about the right of gays and lesbians to get married, but in doing that, we're furthering this idea of marriage as the idea and ideal of a relationship and love. And similarly, what Linda did was she was able to slot herself with her thick Brooklyn accent into the idea of a good neighbor. But then there's those Muslims from places like Syria, okay, or overseas. And they're not like Linda. They're the people we should be keeping out of our country. And so in a lot of ways this whole idea of narrative and storytelling, which is getting a lot of play in activist circles, is great. But it often means telling stories that people already have heard and want to hear. And if we're truly radical, we've got to actually create an entirely new story. Now, the good news is there's a way to do that. And art can help. And it involves surprise. Yeah, uh, so, wait, 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 Steve, Steve. So I yeah. just did this whole thing about art, and like, now you just put up a picture of like a highway. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't get it. This is my drive home. This is what it, kind of what it looks like. Um, I teach at the State University of New York at Purchase, which is about an hour from where I live in the Hudson Valley, north of New York City. And um, sometimes when I leave work, I'll think. I'm going to, I need to stop and get butter or milk or something, uh, or I'm not going to be able to make this recipe that I've had in mind for this dinner. And so I got it on my way home. I'm going to stop at the grocery store and I'm going to pick up these things I need for my meal. And then I drive on roads like this that are very uneventful and I kind of space out. And the next thing I know, I'm pulling into my driveway and I think like, oh, I forgot to go to the grocery store. Um, and then there's other days where something like this happens, where a deer walks out into the road. And when the deer walks in the road, I'm like, all right, how fast is the deer going? I need to hit the brakes. When was the last time I had my brakes done? Um, I uh, have the wheels locked up. Is there a car behind me? When was the last time it rained? Is there oil on the road? Is it icy? Is there a car in front of me? Are there other deer around? How many deer? Um, how fast am I going now? And all those thoughts that I just named off happen in like a half a second. And so when I'm doing this, I'm barely thinking at all. And when this happens, I, I have a lot of cognition, right? There's a lot of stuff that happens. So the idea here is that surprise is what causes thought. When there's an artist named Darren O'Donnell, he says, all learning comes from discomfort. 
meaning when things happen as we expect them to, um, we don't really think about it. When it's when things happen that we don't expect is when, when we're forced to think, right? Like when I was being provocational about um, clubbing seals, right? It's like, then you have to think about why it's wrong, but you don't have to think about it if you just look at the picture. Um, it's just wrong, that's it. Um, and there's a lot of examples like this. Um, so, you know, hey, wait, yeah. wait. So, you got seals and you have deer, but they're supposed to be about art. So, yeah. like, what, what, what's, what's the art part? So, here's an example. Uh, well, I'm not a good museum goer. When I go to a museum, I can walk into a gallery and there's something there, right? And I can look at it and I'll try to make sense of it for a minute and then, or less. And if I can't make sense of it, I go, ah, well, yeah, it's a sculpture. And then I move on. But if you took that same sculpture while I was asleep and put it in my bedroom so that when I woke up and got out of bed, there it was, then I would think, what is this? Who made it? Why did they put it here? What's it made of? What are they trying to tell me? Um, how did they make this thing? All this stuff that I should be thinking about artwork in galleries, but I don't because I have a category for it. I can, I can just say that's art and forget about it. It's the surprise part that causes me to think. And yeah, so, and, yeah. And this, this is how avant-garde art is supposed to work. I mean, when Marcel Duchamp takes a urinal and puts it in a gallery, what he's trying to do is use the element of surprise to get people to question what is art, what is authenticity, what is the idea of even the artist themselves. Um, and I'm sure it was incredibly shocking at that moment. Now, if you walk into a gallery and see a urinal, um, most likely you'd be like, yeah, whatever. But avant-garde art has always been, and what they're really good at is creating that element of surprise. And what that element of surprise is really about is using shock to get people to sort of knock them out of their cognitive patterns and start thinking in a new way. And this, this actually holds true for, for political protest as well. If you see a protest that looks like a protest, you immediately categorize it as a protest. And you may be sympathetic to protest or you may be hostile to protest. But either way, you've already made up your mind about what it is before you've actually experienced it. But if a protest doesn't look like a protest, then you have that moment. So back, in a, back about a decade or two ago, I was an organizer for a group called Reclaim the Streets, which started in London. And their great genius was to create protests that looked like parties. Um, and what was wonderful about it is that neither the passerbys or the police actually knew quite what it was. But, and this is a key thing that Steve's going to get to next, it offered enough cues so people could figure out what it was about. Because if surprise is too surprising, then it actually gets discounted as nonsense. Yeah, and this is often the problem with avant-garde art, is that it's just too far and it becomes illegible. And so I have this painting, right? It's, where it's like there's a deer right in front of you and you don't see it um, because it's not, there's not enough familiar there to make it understandable while still unfamiliar to be surprising. Right? Wait, I see the deer. I don't get the point. Yeah. Well, there's five deer in the photo. If you look in the trees, maybe I can. Oh. Like there's oh. one here, there's one here, right? But we don't see them at first because they're uh, they're they're too strange, right? And so this is the problem with the avant-garde that you or the sort of this is why it's an art, right? Is you have to balance this it being familiar and legible while being strange enough that it causes people to think and, and process the information. And, and this, is where, this is why artistic activism can be so great, is that it's not like directly telling you what to think. It, like the surprise causes you to think and causes you to make sense of it for yourself. So Steve, we're about 10 minutes away from being done. So yeah. we probably have a lot more to say, but uh, let's see what people have to, uh, if they have any questions for us. Yeah. 
So, okay, I've got one from Madeline here. This is the most recent one. I'm having a little trouble reading these full questions, so give me a sec here. But mm -hmm. um, it says, oh, I can't do this. How do we, I'll do my best with seeing as much as I can. My, I don't know what the deal is here, but how do we make use of narrative and emotion while still moving towards a culture? It's not helpful, is it? <laughs> Well, I, <laughs> I don't know we can fill in the rest of the story for you, based on our preconceived oh, a culture of rational skepticism. How Great. do we make use? Thank you, Madeline. How do we make uh, use of narrative and emotion while still moving towards a culture of rational skepticism? That's a great question, um, and it has to do with telling a compelling story about the need for rational skepticism. Now, one of our favorite stories to, to tell is Hans Christian Andersen's uh, The Emperor Wears New Clothes, uh, Emperor's New Clothes, which is about this emperor that is tricked into wearing a non-existent suit of clothing. A young boy is the only one that sees it for what it really is, tells the truth, and the scales fall from people's eyes, and everybody whispers the truth from one ear to the other, and they live happily ever after in a world of rational skepticism. Um, and it's an awesome story. And the key here is it's an awesome story. That is, Hans Christian Andersen didn't write a white paper about the need for rational skepticism. He actually told a fairy tale. Um, and so we can actually create stories about all sorts of stuff. And we can create stories that have real verifiable facts within them. But we have to never forget that we need to be able to tell a story, even if that story is about the need for rationality. Science is a story. It's yeah. very important to, to think, that, think about that. Is that what a theory is, is it's a story which makes sense of verifiable evidence. And fantasies and lies are a story too. But we can have stories which are about facts, which encourage people to look back into the story, decide things for themselves. But it's got to be told as a, as a desirable ideal. If you have any other questions, go ahead and type them in. Um, we're going to, we only have a few minutes. But the other thing I would say is um, that, you know, it's a lot easier to use uh, narrative and emotion and surprise and stuff when you don't have to worry about the facts. Uh, it just, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, makes it easier. And, uh, and because that's been done, um, doesn't mean that we should turn away from those tools. It just means we have to find, we have to be more creative. We have to be better at it. Um, all right. So what are environmentalists, or why are environmentalists generally failing to move the needle on our cultural narrative of human domination? That, that's a big question. Want I take that, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm reading a thing about the opposite about, I'm trying to challenge myself on it, but, um, um, I think this is a separate thing. Um, the, the environmental thing right now actually has to do with um, not about changing the culture. The culture is there. I think people understand the value of um, conservation uh, generally, at least in where I am in the U.S. I'm not sure where you are, Frank. Um, but the problem is a sense of agency, of not knowing what to do. Um, you know, I've changed all my light bulbs, I recycle, and, you know, I bought a hybrid car, right? What do I do now? How do we stop this? And that, that is, that feels disempowering, and that's a different problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's like figuring out how to, how to tell, how to, um, how to provide people with an action that is meaningful. I would add to that that I think that the story that environmentalists have told is actually a, a, a profoundly disempowering story. Um, that is, it's a story, and we talked about this a bit a couple of episodes ago when we were talking about utopia and dystopia, which is a dystopian story which revels in how fucked we're all going to be. Um, and it's an easy story to tell because that is kind of where we're headed, right? But that type of a story, which environmentalists use all the time, actually acts against the sort of agency that Steve is talking about. Yeah. If you really believe that the world is going to end with huge tidal waves 
um, and earthquakes and all sorts of disasters, you really are put in this sort of disempowered position of, well, what can I possibly do? But I think what the environmentalist movement really needs to do is actually tell the story of an environment that's saved. Tell the story of what the world will be like with a beautiful environment, with a stable environment, with a sustainable society, where we can actually act to bring that about. Dystopianism and fear is actually really effective but it's fundamentally disempowering, which isn't a problem if you're a fascist. Um, they don't want to empower people. But for those of us who actually believe in democracy and believe in empowering people, the dystopian narrative of environmentalism is actually the wrong way to go. Um, what is it called? Disasturbation? Um, it's like it's a perverse pleasure in our own destruction. Yeah. So let's do one more and then we'll wrap up. Um, in talking about stories, you mentioned the need for hero, the hero and villain dichotomy. We actually just said heroes and villains. We didn't say dichotomy, um, which I'll explain. Then in talking and thinking about radically proposing new stories, um, do you really believe that dichotomy is essential? I'm skeptical that this is actually an inherited format of understanding right and wrongness. Great um, point. Yeah. Um, I would say that there have been heroes and villains in stories since there have been stories. Um, and it is a part. You don't have to use it, but it's there. And it, the, your villain doesn't have to be a bad person, a sort of two-dimensional bad person, and your hero a two-dimensional good person. You can have conflicted villains. You can have um, conflicted uh, heroes. But it is something that we've incorporated in how we communicate for a long time, and it's powerful. And I wouldn't turn away from it. Uh, I would figure out how to use it. And maybe subvert it. Yeah. Um, but you have to start, it goes back to the too surprising is illegible. You have to start where people are, and then you can mess with it. But if we just go immediately to this world without heroes and villains, which is kind of a great world, right? Um, it just will become not a story. And if it's not a story, people won't listen to it. So it's, again, it's that art between surprise and tradition between the illegible and the legible and that's why artistic activism is an art so yeah. Steve what and there's, there's always a way to do this poorly right like every example we give you can do it poorly the trick is like figuring out how to do it really well and how to how to take advantage of these different things in the right ways at the right times um, and so that, that's the thing to think about is like okay if this is true how can I use it um, okay so we have to wrap up though yeah we gotta go um, so I'm going to launch this poll. Um, we have three things that we can cover next, and it will show up on your screen. Um, you can hit a button. We can do more examples from history, which will build on what we did before. Um, the creative process specific to artistic activism, so you know how that works when you're coming up with um, artistic activist projects. And then sympathy for the other, for audiences, and how you can persuade them. So go ahead and um, fill those out. And, and while they're filling it out, I just want to make a plea for um, to support us um, and to support us with your love, but also support us with any spare change you might have. Um, and we like to think about this as like if we were to hang out and talk, uh, you might want to buy us a cup of coffee. Um, or if it was lunchtime, you might want to buy us lunch. Or if it was dinner. You might want to buy dinner time. You might want to buy us dinner and drinks and get us loaded and see how long we talk and then buy us dessert and then maybe some after dinner drinks and so on and so forth. Um, and so <laughs> think about contributing at that level, coffee level, lunch level, or dinner and drinks level. Um, and you could do this really easily by just going to our website, artisticactivism.org, and finding the donate button and go. And I put a link in the chat. chat. What's that? I put a link in the chat. Right. And if you do it this week, actually, um, you'll get a special bonus gift of a can of whoop ass or can do, which is suitable for gift giving. Um, we're not above commodity fetishism, particularly when it's only an ideal and not an actual product. Uh, <laughs> but do but do support us. Um, we are doing this out of our own pockets. We didn't budget for this um, in our budget. Uh, we, like everybody else, were rather surprised and uh, devastated by a Trump victory. But we felt we really had to get these ideas out there to make more effective activists, to make more creative activists, 
to make more artistic activists. And so this is our little bit. And thank you so much for sharing your time with us. And what are we doing next time, Steve? Um, it's, it's very close. Most people say oh. creative process. Nice. So we, that, we can do the other one next. We will yeah, not try to uh, examples from history. Okay, so um, after the new year, we'll be back with the creative process, and then we're going to go back to our weekly or bi-weekly schedule, and after that, we'll do sympathy for the other. Yeah, sounds all good. Right. Um, and uh, thank you all for your attention and your presence, and your. Uh, we hope this is helpful, and we'll see you next time. How long do I have to do this, Steve? Until you turn off your camera. <laughs> Hey, Gene.